Welcome to Truth and Life Urban Ministry, where faith and activism meet. Here's your host, Brother Leon Prophet to the streets and pastor to the people. What's going on, Truth and Life Urban Ministry family? What is going on this morning? I am your pastor, Pastor Leon, prophet to the streets and pastor to you good people. So let's go on in here. Let's pray. Father, Lord God, I thank you, Lord, for another morning. I thank you, Father, Lord God, for this house. I thank you, Lord God, for the viewers, for the listeners. I thank you for what you are doing in the congregation as well as the community. So, Father, we just give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise this morning. You are worthy to be praised. So, Father, Lord God, we pray for the marriages this morning, Lord God. We thank you right now, Lord God, that you are doing a work in the midst of our houses, Lord God. You are doing a work in the midst of the marriages, Lord God. And so, Father, we thank you right now. We bind the enemy that will try to come against the marriages. We bind the enemy that will try to come against the husbands and the wives getting together their unity, their bond in the name of Jesus. Because, Lord, your word says... What God has brought together, let no man put asunder. And so, Father, Lord God, we come against the spirit of divorce. We come against the spirit of extramarital affairs. We come against those spirits that would try to bring disunity and try to break the harmony and the atmosphere of the house in the name of Jesus. But we proclaim in the name of Jesus that there will be a spirit of reconciliation a spirit of love and a spirit of comfort because Lord God, you said in your word, husbands love your wives, even as Christ so loved the church and gave himself for it. So Lord, I decree the love of God in the husband's heart. I decree the love of God over the home, over the woman's heart in the name of Jesus, the mature love that will cast out fear. And so Lord, I decree in the name of Jesus, That if there is any past emotional issues or traumas, we decree in the name of Jesus that those things will be broken, that 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 we will not live from our past. I decree in the name of Jesus that the witchcraft that is trying to come against your marriage in the name of Jesus, that it will not prevail against you. That the generational curse of divorce is broken. That the generational curse of affairs is broken in the name of Jesus, because the word of the Lord says that whatsoever things we bind in the heavens are bound in the earth. So I bind these things and I loose the spirit of love. I loose the spirit of unity. I loose the spirit of strength in the name of Jesus, that you will begin to have resilience, a dutiful mind. Not a beautiful mind, but a dutiful mind to understand and know that marriage requires you to be on duty, that it requires work. And from that work, you will get beauty. And from that work, you will develop love. And from that work, you will develop companionship. And from that work, you will develop what people are seeking, such as soulmates. Because it will bind you together because you come together in love because the Bible says that two are better than one. And how can two walk together except they be agreed? So I decree over you right now and I speak the word of the Lord over you right now. That you will succeed and not fail and that your marriage will be an example that not only will you minister to each other collectively, but you will be. Again, to have ministry that is outside of the marriage, that is that is outside your home, that is outside the confines. You will begin to blend together, to do things together that will benefit the community as a collective and as a whole. And so that is what God is calling you to. And I decree it in the name of Jesus that you will develop legacy, that you will build and develop legacy in the name of Jesus, that it will be for you. That it will do for you. That favor will begin to open up doors and do for you what you cannot do for yourself. And so I decree that the word of the Lord over you this day 
will be success. So get the counseling. Do what you need to do. Learn in the name of Jesus. The most important thing that you have to do is that you have to be willing. You have to be willing to change. You have to be willing to be in a place where you're like, okay, it's not about who's right or who's wrong. How do we fix the issue? How do we move on? That is what is most important, being willing. Because the Bible says that if ye be willing, if ye be willing, ye shall eat the good of the land. So now you haven't made a mistake. You're just going through some trials right now. You're going through a season right now. And I decree right now, some of you, you need to get your eyes open. You do have a good spouse. Some of you need to get the blinders off and stop watching Netflix. You do have a good spouse. Don't allow romantic comedies and art to take and taint your vision because a lot of people fall in love with imagination. And if it ain't like Netflix, if it ain't like porn, it ain't going to happen. I'm going to tell you, those things are fake. And that's what you need to understand. What God is giving you is real. What God is giving you is the reality. So don't fall in love and be taken by fantasy and imagination. Do that which is before you. Work. And you will reap the benefits. You will reap the harvest. So I know we spent a good time in prayer this morning, but I'm here to tell you, man, it is worth it. So let's go on in here. We are still in our series in the place of God and we are in part 10. I'm going to be finishing up this real soon. And soon as we finish up, we are going to go into our next series. We're going to begin to talk about the glory of God, because that is what God has put on my heart to talk about his glory and the glory of God in your life that is over your life and the glory of God that's going to be revealed. So that's where we're going to be going. Hopefully we'll be done with Joseph by the middle of this month. But the one thing that I want you to know and understand is that, man, it has been good because we are in the place of God. So I want to talk this morning about the word of the Lord trying us or the word of the Lord testing us. And the one thing that I want you to understand is that when the word of the Lord comes, it will come to test you. The word of the Lord came to Joseph in a dream and it tested him. It tried him. But I want to begin to bring this from Psalms 105, but before we go there, the one thing that we always talk about is that we're taking this aspect of Joseph and we're starting it from the end and we're going to give you, you know, commentary from the end. We start right here at the end, but then we're going to go all the way back to the beginning and then we're going to build up to the end. So it's like a movie, like that movie uh, Fearless with Jet Li, how you saw the end part. And then it went all the way back to the beginning. So that's what we're doing this morning. The reason why we are using the book of Jasher is because, like I said, the book of Jasher, it gives you a more detailed, a, a more detailed story, an illustration of the book of Genesis to a certain degree, and even the Old Testament. And so the one thing that I want you to see is that when you're dealing with the book, of Jasher, you're dealing not only with symbolism, but you're also dealing with illustration. And that's the one thing about the Bible and, and holy texts. Not only, you know, can you use it as examples, you can use it as symbols. Because that's what the Bible is. It's illustrations, it's symbols, and, and, and we learn from the example of the word. Not only do we learn what to do, we also learn what not to do. And so it will behoove you to get not only a King James Version, but also get yourself an Apocrypha and a Book of Jasher. And I want to also add in that, get yourself a Holman Christian Standard. Because that is an English version of the Bible, and it is a version of the Bible that I love my, myself. I love that, that, that version right there. That's my favorite English version. I mean, they got the NIV, you got the New King James Version, but I'm not going to lie. When I put my first book together, Church Member 101, I used the Holman Christian Standard. And so probably my next book, I'll probably use the Holman Christian Standard. And so the one thing that I want you to understand is that 
when you are reading the Bible, there has to be understanding. Because it says in the Word of God, in the book of Proverbs, in all thy getting, get understanding. So you have to understand what you read. You have to understand the illustrations. You have to understand the symbolism behind everything that we read in Scripture. Now, you know, you can take things figuratively. You can also take things literally. But the one thing that I want you to understand and know is that it is the Word of God. We live by the principles. We live by the teachings. We live by the revelation. And the one thing that I want you to understand is this, and I heard this from a dear elder. His name is Baba Haru. And he said, when logic is present, belief sits down. And so the one thing that we have to begin to understand and know is that we have to have logic. We have to have knowledge when it comes to the word of God. So like my pastor, my former pastor, Pastor Georgie e. Hilton, he used to say, get into the word until the word gets in you. And that is what we're going to strive to do. We're going to get into the word until that word gets in us, until it begins to begins to form in us a faith that will bring us to a place where we can act. Because the Bible says that I will show you my faith by my works. Because that's what faith is for. Faith is for living, but faith is for action. You have to have faith to work. You have to have faith to see that thing come to pass. To, to see that thing in the beginning. To, to realize, yo, you got to have faith and endurance in the messy middle. And then you got to have faith to, to complete the task. So you got to have starting faith. You got to have working faith in the middle. And then you got to have finishing faith, or like some people call it, finishing grace. But the one thing that I will say is that you need strength for the beginning, definitely strength for the middle, and definitely strength for the end to bring it home. Because the one thing about your life is this, is that life is not going to give you nothing for free. You're going to have to fight. There's going to be a struggle, but you're going to win. And at the end of the day, the Bible has said that all things are possible to him that believes. I'm going to go a step further. All things are possible to him that knows. And so, yeah, I'm playing on words and you can even say that I'm adding to, but I want you to know, man, you got to own your belief. You got to know. It's, it's more than just believing and, and, and wondering not. You got to know. You got to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is. That he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You have to know that. And so that is what we are striving to do in Truth and Life Urban Ministry. This ain't about creating dumb saints who are going to follow. No. You're going to be the type of people, free thinkers, who know how to operate in faith, who know how to seek God, who can prophesy to themselves, who know how to pray, who know how to lay hands on, on the sick, because that is the goal. That, that, that you are a son of God, just like I'm a son of God. You are your own prophet, just like I'm my own prophet. Because the Bible says, as a man thinketh, and I'm going to even go a step further, as a man saith, so shall he be. As a man thinketh, so is he. And you create your words by your thoughts. You create your, 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 your words and your world by your thoughts. If you think poor, you're going to speak poor. If you think highly, if you think, yo, I'm better than this. Talking about, you know, present day circumstances, then you will rise above it. And that's the one thing that I want you to know. That's the one thing that I want you to see is that that is what God has called us to. To rise above circumstances and situations. Faith is for living. Survival mode is not for living. You can't live survival mode all your life. And I was talking with a dear woman of God, and, and we were talking about the educational system. The educational system in the world today gives us our gives our kids an education on based on survival mode. Especially if it's public. You got to get to the place where you educate yourself, you educate your children. In an atmosphere that will prepare them for the future. That will tell them where they come from. But also prepare them for the future. And a lot of it is nothing but survival mode. 
And we can't begin to live in survival mode for the rest of our days. And the crazy thing about it is that there's a whole lot of stuff that we in the black community have to unlearn. We've been indoctrinated and programmed to hate ourselves, to hate our ancestry, to hate our heritage. But I'm here to tell you this day that in the name of Jesus, that thing is broken from over us. Every aspect of Western Christianity, I'll break it in the name of Jesus. Every aspect of weaponization of white Jesus is broken from off of us in the name of Jesus. Yeah, I said it, in the name of Jesus. Because at the end of the day, we have to begin to break these chains. Because how is it that we can call ourselves a son of God when, when, when the image that is portrayed of the son of God doesn't even look like us? And I'm not saying, yo, we make Jesus black because we got to do more than just have a, a, a black Jesus. We have to begin to understand that when we say decolonize our faith, we're going to fill it with Africa. We're going to fill it with our heritage. We're going to fill it with the lineage that we come from because everything has come out of Africa. But the devil and people who are racist have come to not only take away, take your body, but also take your mind and give you amnesia to make you think that you come from a destitute place. Africa is so rich. And that's why there's people over there right now who are raping its resources. But I'm here to tell you this day. That God is going to give you identity. God is going to give you significance and dignity. And we're going to find it not only in the scriptures, but we're going to find it in our history. We're going to find it. And we're not going to demonize it. We're not going to vilify it. But we're going to embrace it because it is where we come from. So let's go over here. Genesis chapter 50. Verse 19. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not. For I am in the place of God, but as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. And that was Genesis chapter 50, verse 19. And so, as we get into this series, In the Place of God, we're going to come to the part where the word of the Lord is trying Joseph. And the one thing that I want you to understand and know is that the test came to him before he was made prime minister or second in charge of, of, of Egypt. But the one thing that I want you to understand is that he was tested in the pit. He was tested in the prison. He was tested in the house of Potiphar. And, and the greatest test comes a lot of times when there's nothing. When there's nothing but darkness, when there's nothing but pain, and the test comes to see whether or not you are going to stay true to, you, to what God has called you to, to see if you're going to stay true to your integrity. And so a lot of times people fail tests in the beginning because they can't stay true to integrity. They can't stay true to, to what God has placed before them. They can't stay true to the dream. And then the other part of the test comes is that when you are giving, giving power and authority, are you going to get to the place where you're going to seek out vengeance? Because Joseph could have worked very well, did that when it came to Potiphar. Because if you look back and listen to, you know, the messages that I did before, Potiphar's wife came to, came to Joseph in jail to vex him, say, yo, I can bring you out of here. Now, when Joseph became second, he could have very well been like, yo, get me Potiphar and his wife. He could have very well had them executed. He could have very well, you know, said, Potiphar, I'm not going to pay you. Potiphar, you know, I'm going to send you over to, to mo the most destitute place ever. Pack your whole house and roll. He could have very well did that. But at the end of the day, the one thing that I want you to know is that Joseph he still kept his relationship with God. And it wasn't no get back. It wasn't no big payback. I ain't gonna lie, I love that song by James Brown. The big payback. <laughs> you know, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I'm serious, I love it. 
But at the end of the day, the one thing about vengeance is this. Is that vengeance, it may gratify your flesh, but it will do nothing for you internally. I'm serious. And a lot of times we think that, you know, if I get vengeance, then I'll have peace. No, vengeance will never bring peace. And so the one thing that I want you to realize is this, is that anything that is external, it cannot heal internal pain. The only thing that can heal the internal pain is the eternal. And what I mean by eternal is the eternal spirit of God, the eternal spirit of the whole of the Holy Ghost that will come and comfort you. That is why he is called the comforter. And that's the one thing that I love about God is that when when the Bible says that, you know, that the, that time can be redeemed. God, he can take you from a moment in time where you got violated, where you, you know, you stayed in that moment, but time moved on. You got older. People around you got older, but you still were stuck in that moment. God has a way that he can go back to that moment, heal you in that moment and bring you present. And that is only done by the eternal power and spirit of the living God. And so that's the one thing that I want you to see. That is the one thing that I want you to know. Because at the end of the day, we try to self-medicate with sex. We try to self-medicate with drugs, with shopping, with eating, with all types of things. To heal those internal wounds. To heal those internal traumas. To heal those things that made us stop in that moment because we want to move on. And I totally get it. But at the end of the day... You may try to self-medicate, but it doesn't silence the ghosts. You're still there. Only God can bring you present. And that's the one thing that we as deliverance people have to understand is that we have to begin to, to pray for people, but also minister to a people in a way that can help them become present. Because some people are still stuck in what happened in 1985. Some people are still stuck in what happened in their childhood. Some people are still stuck... You know, in, in the grieving process, the, the loss of a, of a spouse or, or, or a parent or even a sibling. Some people are still stuck, you know, knowing, you know, that they, their brother or their sister, you know, they found them because their brother or sister committed suicide. And when you are traumatized like that, when you find a body, you know, sometimes that, that can leave lasting, you know, that can leave lasting effects on you. But I'm here to tell you this day that no matter what, God can heal the wound. But we got to trust him. And that's the one thing that I want you to know. You know, the word of the Lord comes to try us just like it tried Joseph. But I'm here to tell you this day is that the word of the Lord is going to try you. Destiny is going to try you because if you want anything, you're going to you're going to be tested. And that's the one thing about life. There will be tests in life. And it just ain't in school. It's about life. How bad do you want it? How, how how far are you willing to go? And sometimes you got to have, <laughs> you got to be like the Matrix. Yo, I want to see how far the rabbit hole goes. You're going to have to have that. You're going to have to be like, yo, Lord, if it means I had to be Neo, yeah, I was ready to, to lose it. But I want to see how far it goes. And sometimes you can't get to the place where you just want to be put back to sleep. Or you just want to try to sleep it off and, 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 and wake up and think that you had it. It was just a dream. No, it's not a dream. It's reality. And we got to begin to be sober. Because there are so many people that are drunk right now. You got to begin to sober up and wake up. This is the reality. What are you going to do? This is the hand that you've been dealt. What are you going to do? You can't sleep off life. You got to get to the place where, okay, whatever it takes, you know, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to stand on what God says. Come hell or high water and trust and believe hell will come and so will high water. Because at the end of the day, it is part of life. The one thing that I want you to know is that in life, you're going to have seeds. These seeds are buried deep in the earth. And because of the pressure and the heat 
that seed explodes and it begins to form new life. And the first thing that it forms is the roots, the roots that will grow deep, the roots that will grow wide and the roots that will give it sustainability so that when you begin to see the blade, the ear, the full corn in the ear, you will know that that thing can stand because it has width and it has depth. And a lot of times we don't have the patience to see things go deep and go wide. We all we, we just want that thing to just spring up automatically. And I'm here to tell you this day, it's not going to happen automatically. Anything that happens that fast will not have sustainability. And if you want a good marriage, that marriage is going to have to have depth. It's going to have to have width. You're going to have to cultivate it. You're going to have to water it. You're going to have to keep the, the little bugs and the foxes off of that thing. But the one thing that I love about it is that when you begin to see that thing begin to blossom and grow, and then when it comes to its full maturity, and then you'll see its seasonal fruit. And then you'll see it bloom. And that's the one thing that I love about growth. Is that you'll see it in, in seasonal. You'll see it seasonally. You'll see it when the leaves fall, but you'll also see it when they begin to bloom. And there are some things in life where you're going to see things fall off, but then you're going to see things blossom and bloom. And then you're going, you're going to begin to see the fruit of those things. And that's the one thing that you got to realize. You know, God says, as long as the earth remains, there will be seed time and harvest. Not only is that literally, but that is also spiritually and figuratively as well. Because the Bible says that as a man soweth, so shall he also reap. And so the one thing that I want you to know is this. Is that you got to have faith in your actions and what you're doing. But you also have to have faith to wait it out. Because I ain't going to lie. The toughest thing right now for Christians and even myself. Is when we are in limbo. When we are waiting. When we are in that in between place. It's like, God, will you just take me? Will you just let me fall? You know, it's. It, I'm serious. I've been there. I have been there because it just seemed like it just didn't make no sense because, you know, you praying, you believing, it just seemed like door after door after door after door after door is closing. And then at the end of the day, it's like, man, God. And then all of a sudden, man, just when you think that you can't take it no more, God opens up a door. And I ain't going to lie, God did that for me. And I'm going to tell you the story. I just can't tell it to you right now. But that is the word of the Lord trying you. That is the word of the Lord testing you. When you feel like that you can't take no more and then all of a sudden now, you know, you're still standing on God and you had you didn't had times where you done wavered and you've just been like, you know what, man, forget this. I'm done. I ain't gonna lie. I know, I know what it is. I, I trust. You can't call yourself a Christian if you ain't been willing to walk out on God. Seriously. Because we get mad at God. And, and we just, it just don't make no sense. I, I've been there. Trust, I've been there. But I'm here to tell you this day is that, man, yo, God, he can take it all. He can take you being mad. He can take you even cussing at him. But at the end of the day, God is going to be like, hey, all right, you know, you need to do what you need to do. Get that off. But I'm still here. And I'm still going to work for you. And I'm still going to, I'm still going to, you know, be there for you because I'm your father. And that's the one thing about God. He will always be our father. It don't matter, you know, what we've got into. I love the, the illustration of the prodigal son. This is, this is my son who was dead and is now alive. You will always be a child of God. Because the Bible says, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become sons of God. Your sonship never changes. It never leaves you. You may try to leave it. But the one thing that I love about God, he will never leave you. Because he always said in his word that I will never leave you nor forsake you. So, you know, the biggest thing that comes to us as Christians. The biggest temptation is when the devil comes to make us doubt. 
are, are sonship. To make you doubt that you're a daughter, you're a son of God. And that's the one thing that tries us. So let's go over here. I want to take you over to Psalms 105. And as I pull it up on my Bible app, I want you to know and understand is that the word of the Lord does come to try us. Even even when it says, you know, pro we get prophetic words, those prophetic words, they try us. And so, you know, the phrase war for your prophecy, that basically means, yo, whatever you got to do to strap in, whatever you do to, you know, you got to hold on, but have faith that that word is going to come to pass. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. So the one thing that I'll say that prophecy is, prophecy is testimony of what was, what is, and what is to come. And so, you know, the Bible says and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. So, you know, it could be a prophetic word that you use to overcome the enemy. It can use words that you testify of God's goodness and glory. You're speaking prophetically anytime you say that. So you can overcome by the words of your testimony. And that's Revelations 12, 11. And the one thing that I want you to understand is this, is that in the book of Job, it says that thou shalt decree a thing and it will be established unto thee. Then the light shall shine upon thy way. The light. What is light? Light is understanding. Light is illumination. So when it says that thou shalt decree a thing and it will be established unto thee, then the light or the understanding It'll help you see that thing more clear. And that's the one thing that we need right now. We need clarity when it comes to the calling upon our lives. We need clarity when it comes to our families. We need clarity when it comes to our marriages, when it comes to our homes. We need clarity. Because a lot of times when distortion comes, we end up making mistakes because we can't hear clear or we can't see clear or we can't understand it clear enough. So we need clarity. So I decree over you that you will not be dull of heart, dull of hearing or blind. But I decree a spirit of clarity over you right now in the name of Jesus. I speak it over you right now that you will have clarity when you make decisions, that you will have clarity in your choices, that you will have clarity to what is set before you in the name of Jesus. And you will not be dull of heart. You will not be uh, dull of hearing. And you will not be blind when you will not have blurred vision in the name of Jesus, but you will begin to see it clearly. You will understand it clearly in the name of Jesus. You will discern it clearly in the name of Jesus. So I decree over you right now clarity. And so you need to decree over you for this week that you will have clarity for the week. That you will have clarity in your relationships. That you will have clarity in business. In Jesus name. That there will be clarity in your home so that you can know what's what, who's what, and then you know how to operate in the situation. Because that's what we need. We need clarity. Ain't no more guessing. You got to know that thing. And just like they said in the Matrix, there's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path. So we got to begin to know. Let's go on down here. Psalms 105, and I'm going to start at 15. I ain't going to lie. This is going to be a play on words. Saying, touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. Moreover, he called for a famine upon the land. He break the whole staff of bread. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron until the time that his word came. The word of the Lord tried him. See, there it is right there. How can we say, touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm, but then we end up in jail. We end up with iron. We end up with fetters. And the crazy thing about it is that when you're going through the test, a lot of times a whole lot of stuff don't make no sense. And you'd be like, hold up. I'm trusting God and this don't make no sense. 
I'm keeping my integrity, but this don't make no sense. How is it that we can say, touch not mine anointed, and I'm in chains? But the one thing that I want you to know is that sometimes the chains are a part of the test. The uncomfortability that comes when you're in fetters is a part of the test. Because a lot of times the test comes to disrupt the comfort zone. I'm going to say that again. Sometimes the test comes to disrupt the comfort zone. And the one thing that I want you to know and understand is that some of us, man, we have been in the comfort zone too long. And then we wonder why, you know, God ain't moving or wonder why, where is God when we've been in the comfort zone? We got to a place in God where we didn't got comfortable. And we feel like, yo, this is it. This going to be my Canaan land. And God is saying, nah, that ain't it. You need to keep on moving. And then sometimes we find ourselves out of the will of God because we have disobeyed God by not following him because we even got comfortable in a certain place or in a certain position in life. And then we feel as though, I ain't got to trust God. I'm, I can just go off of my knowledge. You got to trust God. God gives us knowledge so that, you know, there are certain things that sit down when knowledge comes. But we also have to know that, hey, trusting God is a part of my life. Trusting God is a part of the knowledge. And we just can't, you know, take and throw trust out because we got knowledge. No, you have to know that if I trust, it's going to work out. And that's the God knows truth. So the knowledge that I have is going to, you know, cause the uncertainty to sit down. But in, 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 but in the midst of all of that, I have confidence that it's going to work because I know. It ain't no guessing. It ain't no belief. I'm owning it. And so that's part of the test. You know, when, 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 when things <laughs> are disrupted. And so let's go back in here. Until the word, until the, the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. The king sent and loosed him, even the ruler of the people, and let him go free. And he made him lord of his house and ruler of all his substance to bind his princes at his pleasure and teach his senators wisdom. And that's what Joseph did. That's what Joseph did. If you read it in the book of Jasher, he was in charge of the salaries of the army, of the generals. He was in charge of the money. He was also in charge of gathering into the storehouses corn for, for the famine. Because the one thing, man, that I want you to understand is that God is setting you up to be a deliverer. And sometimes as a deliverer, he'll send you to a strange nation to be a deliverer to not only those people, but to the world at large. So God is going to put you in unfamiliar territory to be a deliverer, to not only save yourself, but to save those who are there and those who are coming. And that's what happened. And in the midst of that, God blessed him. But the word of the Lord tried Joseph. And the one thing that I want you to know, man, is that the word of the Lord even tried his brothers. Because the one thing you have to realize is that Joseph's brothers, man, they sold him. They sold him out. And the greatest pain that you can go through as a person is betrayal by family. You know, people that you have poured your heart out to. People that you have helped them and, and, and now they have betrayed you. But the one thing that I want you to realize is that the test comes and the crossroad comes whether you're going to have redemption or whether you're going to have vengeance. And that is the thing that comes to us. That is the temptation. Are you going to go down the crossroad of vengeance? We talked about that. Or are you going to go down the crossroad of redemption? And that's the one thing that I want you to realize. Because that is, you know, it could go either way. And that is why the word of the Lord comes and it tries us. Because it tries us when, when we are in a place where nobody can see us. You get tested in places of obscurity. But then you also get tested in places of prominence. And so the test that came to Joseph's brothers is the place of obscurity. They sold their brother out. 
But then when their father sent them to go to Egypt, they came to the realization, you know, they came to repentance, a change of mind that, yo, when we go down here, we're going to bring Joseph. We're going to get him and we're going to bring him home. And they made up in their mind and made up in their heart that, you know, the wrong that we did, we're going to right that wrong. And sometimes you have to be, you, sometimes you have to understand that that's where some people are in life, that they're trying to right the wrongs. Because when they did that to Joseph, Joseph was 17. This has been 17 plus years. You know, because when Joseph got out of, out of prison, he was like 30, 30 something. He was in his 30s. And so, you know, when, when, when the famine happened in Egypt, the crazy thing about all of that is that some time had passed. Joseph, he's second in, in charge. He didn't have kids. And so now the famine had hit. And now here it is, his brothers have to come and, and see him. And so the one thing I want you to realize is that when you are in that place of God, the people that did you wrong or the people that stomped on you and that totally forgot about you, betrayed you, oh, trust. There will be a reckoning and there will be a meeting up. Because it always, there's always, the one thing about life is that some things come full circle and you're going to see that. And so the one thing that I want you to realize, man, is that God has called us to be people of integrity, but also be wise. And know this, you can't expect to do people wrong and not meet up with the people that you wrong one day. It's going to happen. And so you have to ask yourself, am I willing to repent? Am I willing to, to, to ask for forgiveness? Am I willing to, to have a change of mind? To not be the person that I was when I committed that atrocious violation. Because trust and believe, if you are the bad guy, you're going to meet up with the people that you violated. One way or another, justice will come. It will visit. And so that's the test that Joseph's brothers had. They ended up going down to Egypt. And so I want to pick up with the story of them coming into Egypt because... The way that Joseph set it up, he was like, yo, they going to have to come here. I, they going to have to come here. So he hooked it up, whereas all the gates were closed and it was only one gate that they could go in. And he sent men to make sure, OK, I want you to bring the names of everybody who comes to me. Bring them to me because I'm looking for these names right here. Joseph gave the guy a list. Watch out for these names. And so the crazy thing about it. Is that they ended up finding, you know, the brothers. But the brothers, they was looking for him because they was like, well, you know, Joseph, he's a pretty boy. So he might be where the girls are. And they couldn't find him. And a lot of times people, they know you in a past event. But they don't know you in present day. Some people can accept the fact that you were weak, where you were this, where you were that. But a lot of times people can't accept the change or, or accept the fact that God has raised you up. So that's the one thing that you have to realize in life. Some people, they like you in your weakness. They like you in your brokenness. But then when you change, all of a sudden it's a problem. So I'm going to tell you right now, watch out for those people. Because if you can't have grace, if you can't accept the, the grace on a person's life to change and to upgrade, and to get to another level, these are the type of people you don't want in your life. Because if they can't accept you changing and changing for the better, they were not meant to be in your life. So if you want to keep me back in chains and keep me in the pit, no, nah, I'm not staying there. You ain't my friend. But the one thing that I want you to know and understand is that you have to have people around you who can accept the fact that God is moving on your life. That God is elevating you. And that they can accept it, but they also support it. And that's the one thing that you have to realize. If they can't accept the change in your life that's for the positive, don't have them in your life. Because the Bible says, do not cast your pearls before swine. The greatest thing that you can do in your life is to begin to elevate. And some things you just can't share with people who want to keep you back. Who want to keep you back when you were weak. Who want to keep you in mistakes. You can't do that. So I'm here to tell you, man, be aware of those folks who always want to talk about, well, don't forget where you come from. 
I haven't forgotten where I come from, but you can't accept where I am. If they can't accept where you are, man, kick them to the curb. They can live in the past. They can do all that. But you, God ain't called you there. Your past is a stepping stone. Your past is a testimony. And so the one thing that I want you to realize and understand is that God is elevating you. He is moving you to another level. He's moving you to another mindset, a, a new maturity, a new belief, a new knowledge, a new revelation. And it's predicated for the future that God is taking you to. And then when you get the knowledge, then that belief can sit down because now you know it and you own it. And that's the one thing that I want you to see. That's the one thing that I want you to know and understand is that God is for you. He is for you now. He is for your future. He was there with you in the past, but it's about the future. And that's the one thing that I love about God. Our walk with God is always a journey. So we're going to go into the book of Jasher, Jasher chapter 51. And the one thing that I want you to know is that this is like, yo, all of a sudden now Joseph's brothers are standing before Joseph. They didn't saw his brilliance. They didn't saw his majesty and they bowed down to him. And that's the one thing that I want you to understand that, yo, in the place of God, you are going to come to a place where you're going to meet up with those people. But you have to get to the fact and you have to get to the place where, OK, I could do a whole lot right here. But I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to play this out. I'm going to see what's going on. And that's what I loved about Joseph, because he didn't automatically come from, hey, I'm your brother. He was like, yo, we're going to see how far and how deep this thing goes. So he played it out. And, and it was a test, not only to his brothers, but also to him. Because you got to begin to look at the wisdom of him hiding his identity. And so the crazy thing about it is that when they stood before him, they ended up bowing. And that is the dream coming to pass. When he told it in the beginning about them bowing down to him. That's what happened when they first met him, when they didn't recognize that he was the second. And a lot of times people will not recognize you when God elevates you. Because they know you from a past place. They cannot recognize the presence, the present, or even the future, or discern the future that God is taking you to. So, let's go in here to the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 51, verse 19. And the sons of Jacob saw Joseph, his figure and comeliness and dignity of countenance seemed wonderful in their eyes. And they again bowed down to him to the ground. See, not only did they bow once, but they bowed twice. <laughs> and Joseph saw his brethren and he knew them, but they knew him not. For Joseph was very great in their eyes. Therefore, they knew him not. See, there it is right there. They didn't know him in the place of prominence. They didn't know him in the present place. They knew him from a past place. They didn't know him in the present place of prominence. Let's continue. For Joseph was very great in their eyes, therefore they knew him not. And Joseph spoke to them, saying, From whence come ye? And they all answered and said, Thy servants have come from the land of Canaan to buy corn, for the famine prevails throughout the earth. And thy servants heard that there was corn in Egypt. So they have come amongst the other comers to buy corn for their support. So see, there it is. That's the mission that Jacob sent them on. Because the famine hit them. Because the Bible says that not only does it rain on the just, but it rains on the unjust. And so a lot of times, you know, he was like, hey, I need y'all to go to uh, Egypt to get corn. And everything. And so they ended up going. And that's when they came to that whole thing. Yo, when we go here, we're going to make what we did wrong right. And we're going to take Joseph out of here with us. So let's continue. And Joseph answered them, saying, If ye have come to purchase, as ye say, why do you come through ten gates of the city? It can only be that you have come to spy through the land. And they all answered together, and they, uh, and they all together answered Joseph and said, Not so, my lord, we are right. Thy servants are not spies, but we have come to buy corn. 
For thy servants are all brothers and the son of one man in the land of Canaan. And our father commanded us, saying, When you when you come to the city, do not enter together at one gate on account of the inhabitants of the land. And Joseph again answered them and said that this thing which I spoke unto you, you have come to spy throughout the land. Therefore, you all came through ten gates of the city. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. So see, he's trying them. Their father said, hey, when you go, don't all go through one gate. Go through different gates. So they, he, you know, the boys did what their father said. But then when Joseph, you know, peaked the strategy, peaked the game, it was like, nah, you guys are spies. Because it don't make no sense that you will go through different gates when y'all could have just came through one. All of y'all. So that's why he's testing them to see where they are. And so that's the one thing about God. Sometimes the, the, the word of the Lord tries us to test us where we are. And a lot of times things, you know, it, it we go, we, we maneuver in a certain way and it just don't make sense how we maneuver. And then people, you know, want to question us. Yo, why'd you do this? Or how come you didn't do that? Because, you know, sometimes you can give them an answer. Sometimes you just can't. You know, sometimes it's just like, because. I just didn't do it that way. Or I just didn't see it that way. And so a lot of times, man, we spend our time in the midst of a test, in the midst of a trial, trying to explain ourselves to people who, who can't really even help us sometimes. So I'm going to tell you right now, man, don't do that. So let's go on back in here. Because the one thing that I want you to know, yes, the word of the Lord does come to try us. But a lot of times in the midst of the trial, you're going to begin to maneuver in a way that people don't understand and can't even discern. But it's not for you. And it's not for them, really. It's not for them to, to try to figure out your moves. You know, God knows. And you know to a certain degree. And I mean, even even you question yourself like, man, why did I do that? It's because, you know, what's in you is, is causing you to do that. The test at times will cause you to maneuver and do things that you probably wouldn't normally have done, you know, consciously. But it's, it's, it's what's been on the inside of you. It's what's the goodness that's on the inside of you. And that's the reason why you just can't operate like everybody else. And that's the God knows truth. Operate out of integrity. Operate out of goodness. Operate out of what God has placed on the inside of you. And don't allow circumstances and situations to darken your heart and cause you to act like an animal. Because, you know, God has not made you a dog to return to vomit. God has made you a man to upright and have dominion over the creatures of the earth. So that's the one thing that I want you to realize. You have divinity. And you are, uh, you are a human being, not an animal. So let's go back in here. And Joseph again answered them and said, That is the thing which I spoke unto you. You have come to spy through the land. Therefore, ye all came through ten gates of the city. You have come to see the nakedness of the land. Surely everyone that cometh to buy corn goeth his way, and you are already three days in the land. And what do you do in the walls of harlots in which you have been these three days? Surely spies do like unto these things. See, there it is. And they said unto Joseph, Far be it from our Lord to speak thus, for we are twelve brothers and the son of our father Jacob in the land of Canaan, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham. The son, the, the, the Hebrew, and behold, the youngest is with our father this day in the land of Canaan. And one is not, for he was lost from us. And we thought perhaps he might be in this land. So we are seeking him throughout the land and have come even to the house of harlots to seek there. And Joseph said unto them, and have ye sought him throughout the earth, that there only remained Egypt for you to seek him in? And what also should your brother do in the houses of harlots, although he were in Egypt? Have you not said that you are from the sons of Isaac, the son of Abraham? And what shall the sons of Jacob do then in the houses of harlots? And they said unto him, Because we heard that Ishmaelites stole him from us, and it was told us, 
told unto us that they sold him in Egypt and thy servant, our brother, is very comely and well favored. So we thought he would surely be in the houses of harlots. Therefore, thy servants went to seek him and give ransom for him. So see, they knew him from a past state. They knew that he was a pretty boy. And so they was like, yo, if he ain't going, you know, he going to be with the girls because he's pretty. And so a lot of times people, they mistake, they mistake, you know, they, they go off of the past and then they make a mistake in the present thinking that you're still in the past. And that's the one thing that I want you to realize is that a lot of times people are going to mis make a mistake thinking that you still live back where you used to live. Nah, that ain't the case. I ain't there no more, brother. I don't live there no more. That's not my life no more. And I've had to tell that, you know, to, to certain people. They knew me when I was out in the strip club. They knew me when I was drinking. They knew me when I was smoking weed. They knew me when I was whore hopping. But when I got to a place in God, I was like, yo, man, that's not my life no more. You know, and, and a lot of times you have to really look at your friends and ask yourself, you know, why is it that they can't move from that place? And a lot of people, they're stuck in certain places. And then they think that you want to revisit that because you're all friends. And it's like, nah. Sorry, dude, I don't, I don't live there no more. It's not my life. I got a family now. You know, I, I, got, I got this now. So you have to understand and know, man, beyond a shadow of a doubt, is that God has called you. The greatest testimony that Jesus had, he said in the book of Revelation, I am he which was dead and I am alive forevermore. And, and, and the one thing about that is that he said in the midst of that, and I'm paraphrasing, I have the keys of death and of hell. Amen. And so the one thing that I want you to understand is that you have come through death, you have come through hell, and you got the keys. You got the keys to unlock and to lock certain things up. Because just as Jesus is, so are you. And I'm going to say that again. Just as Jesus is, so are you. You have the ability to rise from the dead. You have the ability to have keys in your hand. What are keys? Keys are understanding. Keys are the ability to lock and to unlock. Keys are authority. You can open it. You can close it. You can lock it. You can go in and out. And that's the one thing, man, that I love about the Bible, that it shows men going in and out. That it shows men in seasons, that it shows men in their weakness, that it shows men in their strength. And this is the reason why you got to begin to let that word get in on the inside of you. So that you can know what it is to be weak, but you can also know what it is to be strong. You can also know what it means to fall, but you can also know what it means to get up. You can also know what it means to fall into temptation and have your eyes blinded out Samson. But then at the end, you can take and do more in your death than you did in your life. And that's the one thing that I want you to see. Is that the Bible is full of illustrations. But the word of the Lord comes to test us. The prophetic word, the word of success, the word of destiny. It comes to test you because life is not going to give you nothing for free. It always comes with a cost. It always comes with a test. It always comes with a price. And a lot of us feel as though, ooh, I got grace. Man, please. But sometimes, man, you get so daggone full of grace or you feel like you ain't got to do no work. You got to work. You got to work this process. You got to work on studying to show yourself approved. You got to work on discerning the time and the season because you just can't sow seed anytime you feel like it. You got to know when to sow it, where to sow it. And a lot of us, man, we just feel like we Johnny Appleseed and we just have an unlimited supply. We just throw it any old where. And then we wonder why we ain't got a harvest because you don't have the discernment that you need to sow in a specific place. You just can't throw seed on concrete. And expect a harvest. You can't throw seed in the winter and expect harvest. You have to do it when God tells you to do it in the place where God tells you to do it. And then you have to cultivate it. 
And that's the God knows truth. But the word of the Lord, it comes to try. And a lot of times, man, when that thing is trying us, when it's stretching us, when it's taking and, and, and clipping us, pruning us, purging us, we can't take it because it, it requires sometimes for us to unlearn certain things. It requires of us to, to, to unlearn and then relearn again. And a lot of us don't have patience to do it all over again. You have to ask yourself, and I, and I asked this to a friend, I'm like, man, yo, how many, how many do-overs do you think we got in life? How many times do you think we can actually bounce back in life? But the one thing that I want you to know and understand is this, is that at the end of the day, God's word will prevail. And I look at it like this. When you take hold of that word, if all you got, <laughs> that all things will work together for my good, then you hold on to that. Because in the midst of you being tried, you're going to understand that it's going to work out for your good. And a lot of times, man, when, when the Bible says that wisdom is the principal thing, the wise thing for you to do is to hold on to that word. To hold on and know and understand and study it and mutter it and, 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 and begin to let that thing be your meditation. That all things are going to work together for my good when you are in the middle of the test and the trial of your life. That word will come forth. And it will come forth like the breaking of day. And I'm just seeing right now in the spirit, I'm seeing wall a wall being broken and light shining through. That's what I see. I see a darkness of a wall being broken and light shining through that darkness, shining through the hole in that wall. And the wall is being broken. So I'm here to tell you that the barriers of, 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 of your life, the barriers that have been placed in your life to try to hold you back from understanding, to try to hold you back from revelation, to try to hold you back from, from, from being prosperous. And coming into a new level. That thing is being broken in the name of Jesus. I see it. I see it by the eyes of faith. That is being broken. And I see the light shining through. And so you need to begin to declare and decree what you want to see in the midst of that light. Because it says in the book of Genesis, God said, God saw and God called. God said, light be and light was. It says in the book of Job that thou shalt decree a thing and it will be established unto thee. Then the light shall shine upon thy way. The understanding to do, the understanding to act, the understanding to maneuver. That's what light is. Understanding, knowledge, revelation. That's what it is. And that is what God is calling you to in the place of God. So, yes, the word of the Lord is going to try you. But the word of the Lord that you keep will be the word that will get you through that trial, that will get you through that test. And you will come forth on the other side. Let's go back on in here. And Joseph said unto them, and now if you find him and his masters require you of a great price, will you give it to him? And they said, it shall be given. So Joseph is questioning them, saying, if you find your brother in a master's house, are you going to pay the price to give him? And they say, yes. And so here, here it is. And he said unto them, if his master will not consent to part with him for a great price, what will you do unto him on his account? And they answered him, saying, If he will not give him unto us, we will slay him and take our brother and go away. And Joseph said unto them, That is the thing which I have spoken to you. You are spies, for you are come to slay the inhabitants of the land. For we heard that the two of your brethren smote all the inhabitants of Shechem in the land of Canaan on account of your sister. And you now come to do like in Egypt. On account of your brother. So <laughs> the word then got out. Of what they did in Shechem. You know when Dinah got violated. And everything. So now it's like yo word travels. I'm going to tell you man. That's the one thing 
about rumors. Rumors have the ability to travel. And the one thing that I want you to know beyond a shadow of a doubt is that, you know, they heard about Shechem. They heard about Jacob's sons and what they did over there concerning Dinah. And now, okay, you come over here and Joseph is messing with him, playing with him. And you're going to do the same thing on account of your brother? Because they made up in their mind that, yo, we'll pay the price. And if they don't want to give them up, we're going to take and take them. We're going to slay them and we're going to take Joseph. We're going to bring them home. And present them to our father. We're going, we going to turn. We're going to make amends. And I totally get it. And and so, you know, the one thing, you know, that the Bible says. That whosoever shall lose his life shall find it. And so they were willing to lay down their lives. And also slay people just to get their brother back. And so now it's like, you know, they went in the power of that word, of that agreement. And so I want to encourage you, yo, listen to the other messages because I go into that, that they made it. They made a vow within themselves that we going to bring Joseph home. And so the word of the Lord is trying them right now. So let's go back on in here. Only hereby shall I know that you are true men. If you will send home one from amongst you to fetch your youngest brother from your father. And to bring them here unto me, and by doing this thing, I will know that you are right. And Joseph called to the seventy of his mighty men, and he said unto them, Take these men and bring them into the ward. And the mighty men took the ten men and laid hold on them and put them into the ward. Meaning basically, yo, they ended up getting put in jail. Just like they put Joseph in the pit, they ended up getting put in the ward. And they and, and they were in in the ward three days. So they was in jail for three days. They was in the ward for three days. And on the third day, Joseph had them brought out of the ward. And he said unto them, do this for yourselves if ye be true men, so that ye may live one of your brethren shall be confined in the ward while shall go and take home the corn for your household to the land of Canaan and fetch your youngest brother and bring him here unto me. That I may know that you are true men when you do this thing. And Joseph went from them and came into the chamber and wept a great weeping for his pity was excited for them. And he washed his face and returned to them again. And he took Simeon from them and ordered him to be bound. But Simeon was not willing to be done. So he was very powerful and a man. He was a very powerful man and they could not bind him. So see, there it is. Joseph, he, he peeps the game. And the crazy thing about it is that he is so overwhelmed and overcome because he wasn't expecting to see them. And he wasn't expecting to hear this conversation. And so that is what happens when you're in the place of God and things come full circle. That is what happens when you are in the place of God. And the word of the Lord comes to try you when you're at your pinnacle, when you're at your peak, when you're at your best, when you're at your prominence. Because he could have very well had them executed. Just like Potiphar, he could have very well had them executed. But he didn't execute Potiphar and he didn't execute them. And the one thing that that's crazy because it's like all this time and all this conversation you don't even discern or even realize that I'm your brother. You can't even see it. But the thing is, is that sometimes God keeps things hidden in the midst of a test, in the midst of a trial, so that the fullness of the test can bring out of us what is in us. And that's what was happening right here. They couldn't see or discern the fact that this was their brother because they were in the test of their lives, the test of integrity. And a lot of times, man, we fail that test of integrity because we don't allow it to have its full work. The Bible says, let, let patience have its perfect work or its full work. And so a lot of times, man, like they say about the eagles, trust the process. A lot of times we got to begin to trust the process. That this thing, that this test that I'm going through is not going to kill me, but it's going to make me. It ain't going to break me, but it's going to make me. It's going to make me, you know, hold on to what I got. To what has brought me up to here. 
And then it's going to elevate me and push me past it. And the one thing that's coming to my mind right now is that movie, The Last Dragon. And the one thing, man, his training brought him up to a certain place. But then when he got there, he had to remember everything that was taught and it, and it took him over. It took him over into mastery. He went from being a student to a master. Bruce Leroy did. And that's when he started glowing. And I want to remind you is that what the word of the Lord that that was given to you in the past. The word that is that that you have held on to is that same word that's going to help you pass the test that you're in right now. And then when you get to the next level, there'll be another word that you hold on to and it'll help you get past that test and go to the next level. And then you'll have a collection of words. You'll have a collection. You'll have 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 that thing. Of, you know, you'll have that word in your heart. Thy word have I hidden in my heart, in thy in my heart that I might not sin against thee. The greatest sin against God is to is to stop believing, to not think that He's your Father, to think that you ain't a son. That's the greatest sin. But the Bible says, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So I'm here to tell you right now, man, that God has a way for you. I ain't going to lie. Sometimes the, the temptation that comes to us is the greatest temptation to give up. The temptation to quit. The, the temptation to just walk. And I totally get it. Because you'd be like, well, Lord, I've been walking with you this amount of years. And this is what I'm going through. I remember, man, I saw a TikTok video. Who, who told the Lord that I was his strongest servant? I don't understand. I totally got that video. But I'm here to tell you that the word of the Lord will try you. And the thing about it is that it tried Joseph's brothers, but they couldn't even discern that he was before them. And the story, you, you're willing to come and fight for me? You're willing to pay for me? And this is what he wanted in the beginning. This is what he wanted when, when the Ishmaelites was taking him. He was like, yo, look. My father is a rich man. He will pay for me. But they disregarded his cry. He wanted his brothers to fight for him. He wanted his brothers, you know, to, to take him out of the pit. This is what he wanted in the beginning. And now to hear those words, it could have put him in a place of anger. Oh, now you want to fight for me? Oh, now you want to buy me? Could have executed him right there. But he didn't. But, you know, he was so overwhelmed and overcome with the fact that they came for him. And it wasn't like he needed them. Joseph didn't need nothing. <laughs> Being the second in Egypt. But he was so overwhelmed and overcome because the words and the fact that they didn't, they couldn't recognize him. So I totally get it. And sometimes God will keep you hidden. It'll keep you hidden for a certain amount of time and then all of a sudden things will be revealed. So let's go back in here. And Joseph called his mighty men and seven, 70 valiant men came before him with drawn swords in their hands. So see, you know, he's like, yo, we taking Simeon. Because if you look at the, if you look at, you know, the previous events, Simeon was the one who was talking like, yo, let's kill him. So I totally get, yo, if we get anybody Let's get Simeon. Yeah, take Simeon. Because, yo, he wanted to kill me. So, yeah, we taking him. He going to stay here. Rest of y'all can go home, but Simeon going to jail. And Joseph called unto his mighty men. Seventy valiant men came before him with drawn swords in their hands. And the sons of Jacob were terrified at them. And Joseph said unto them, seize this man and confine him in prison until the brethren come to him. And Joseph's valiant men hastened, and they all laid hold of Simeon to bind him. And Simeon gave a loud and terrible shriek, and the cry was heard at a distance. So, yo, Simeon's like, man, y'all ain't taking me. So he gave his battle cry, and everybody got afraid. And all the valiant men of Joseph were terrified at the sound of the shriek, and they all fell upon their faces, and they were greatly afraid and fled. And all the men that were with Joseph fled, for they were greatly afraid of their lives. And only Joseph 
and Manasseh, his son, remained there. And Manasseh, the son of Joseph, saw the strength of Simeon, and he was exceedingly wroth. So here it is. He's like, what? Oh, you're going to act like this in front of my pops? He saw, he saw his uncle's strength, but Manasseh was like, oh, oh, okay. Oh, you want to act like this? Oh, I got you. And Manasseh, the son of Joseph, rose up to Simeon, and Manasseh smote Simeon a heavy blow with his feet against the back of his neck. So he punched him in the back of his neck. He rose up and punched him in the back of his neck, and Simeon was stilled of his rage. And Manasseh laid hold of Simeon and seized him violently, and he bound him and brought him into the house in confinement. And all the sons of Jacob were astonished at the act of the, of the youth. So here it is, Joseph's son. Joseph's son put Simeon in check. And whereas Joseph's mighty men couldn't do it, his son did it. And that's the one thing that I want you to see, man, when it comes to fathers and sons. You have to begin to have sons that can do things that you as the father can't do or even those who you have depended on. And this is the reason why we need to begin to decree, decree and declare over our sons that you're going to do greater than me, that you're going to be stronger than me. And this is the illustration of it right here. Because you're just not going to act any old way in front of my father. You're not just going to disrespect his authority. So the son rose up and put that thing in check. And put Simeon in check. Hit him in the back of his neck. And made him sit down. And Simeon said unto his brethren, None of you must say that this is the smiting of an Egyptian. But it is the smiting of the house of my father. So he said, yo, don't tell them that this, that this Egyptian boy to knock me out. <laughs> Don't tell him that this Egyptian boy, done, you know, done humbled me. <laughs> Don't tell him what happened here. What happened in Egypt, stay in Egypt. What happened in Vegas, stays in Vegas. Yeah, so, yeah, you up here hollering, got all this big stuff, and somebody done met you, Matt Trust. There is always somebody bigger and always somebody stronger. And that's the God knows the truth. So you need to learn that in life. There's going to always be somebody bigger Better, stronger, more prettier, younger, faster, however you want to put it. There's always going to be somebody better than you. And we can sum it all up. And after this, Joseph ordered him to be called, was set over the storehouse to fill their sacks with corn as much as they could carry and to restore every man's money into his sack and to give them provisions for the road. And thus did he unto them. So, the one thing that Joseph did for his brothers, he kept Simeon, kept him in check, but then he also prepared them, gave them what they needed, gave them back their money, and also gave them provisions for the way home. Because the, the, the test was going to come to see whether or not they was going to bring back their younger brother, Benjamin. So he was prepping them for this test. And that's what I mean when I say that the word of the Lord comes to try at times your integrity. Because the test of the Lord comes when you've been a person that's been acquainted with getting over on people and now you have the ability, the test comes and it's like, okay, are you going to, you know, use this person or even I, I'll break it down. The, the cashier that gave you over, you know, more, more change than you supposed to get back. Are you going to be the type to say, hey, you gave me too much or are you going to keep it? Or are you the type that, you know, you supposed to get one thing from the store, but they accidentally give you double. Are you going to keep it and say it's the Lord's blessing? Or are you going to return it? Because a lot of times it's the little things, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's the little things that cause you to fail the test. When you feel like that you can just take advantage and call that the blessing of the Lord. When you can feel like that you can just, you know, steal and call that the blessing of the Lord. When you can take advantage of people in their weakness and in their vulnerability and then try to say that's the blessing of the Lord. No, it's not the blessing of the Lord. You are an opportunist and you are a thief and a robber. Yeah, I said it. And Joseph commanded them saying, take heed lest you transgress my orders to bring your brothers as I have told you. And it shall be when you bring your brother hither to, unto me, then will I know that you are true men and you shall be trafficked 
in the land and I will restore unto you your brother and you shall return in peace to your father. So he's saying, yo, I'm doing this because I'm testing you. I want to test you to see if you are men of your word. I'm, I'm doing this because I want to see what you're going to do. And if you do everything that I ask, you're going to be able to go throughout the land, get what you need to get. And you can go home to your father in peace, all of you together. So even in that, Joseph was saying, yo, you have a way out. And that's the one thing about the word of the Lord. When, when the word of the Lord comes to test us, there is an end. There is an out. But you got to begin to maneuver it. You got to begin to maneuver it in the way. Because the, Jesus said, narrow is the way that leadeth unto salvation. And a lot of times that narrow way is the way of integrity. A lot of times the narrow way is the way of consecration. And so the one thing that I want you to understand is this, is that God has put you in that place and put you in that test for a reason. And it comes a lot of times at the most, oh, at the most worst time ever. You're dealing with one thing and then this comes up. You're dealing with multiple things. And then here comes God's test. Like, okay, Lord, I'm dealing with divorce. I done got hurt at work. And now you testing me? So not only am I getting it at home, I'm getting it at work, and now I'm getting it from you. Now I understand why people say things come in threes. <laughs> I totally get it. <laughs> I totally get it. And a lot of times, that's the things that happen to us. You got, a, you got multiple battles, and then here comes God's test. And, and a lot of times we feel like, okay, whew. And then we always hear that, well, God, don't put more on you than you can bear. I'm like, you know, there, there's been times where I've been in the test and I'm like, I don't want to hear no preaching. I don't want to hear nothing. I think I think a lot of times in those times, I, was, I just was like, don't preach to me about God calling me. I'm like, nah, you can say that God put me in deep, but why the hell do I feel like I'm drowning? That's the test. That's the test. To overcome the feeling of feeling like you drown and to overcome the, the feeling of being overwhelmed. And a lot of times, man, it's like, all right, Lord, I'm just gonna let it, I'm just gonna let it whatever happened, happen. And it just seems like that when you just get that attitude and you don't give up on your faith. Because, you know, the biggest temptation is to walk out and just, you know what, I'm a backslide. I totally get it. But at the end of the day, even if you did backslide, you will never find satisfaction backsliding. You may be like, okay, yeah, you know, you could do one day. But then after a while, you'd be like, I can't even do this no more. I can't get no satisfaction out of this. It's, I know what it is. And I don't care, man, look. When you go back, I don't care. You can try to put dress it up as best as you want. The past is the past for the re for a reason, and that's the God knows truth. You can try to dress it up, put makeup on it, you know, rewrite it, but it's still the past. But I'm here to tell you is that God is for your present. God is for your future. And the one thing, man, this life is about test and trial. Test and trial. The trial is for whether or not you are worthy to go to the next level. And that's where the test comes. Test and trial. But I'm here to tell you right now that God, he will give you strength to endure the trials of life. To also to endure the test of life. Because like I said earlier, life is not going to give you anything for free. You got to work this thing. The Bible says that the kingdom of heaven suffering violent violence and the violent take it by force you got to take it by force you want a new life you got to take it by force you just can't you just can't no nah, man you ain't gonna be able to joel Osteen that thing you're gonna have to be like yo this is mine i'm taking it and i ain't trying to throw shade on joel Osteen. i'm like man it's just some things man you just can't get soft about 
I love his charisma. I love his ministry because his ministry opens up big holes and big doors. But it's sometimes, man, with with with, with his preaching, his preaching, he, his soft, his his you know his smooth delivery and demeanor. Sometimes, man, you're gonna have to be like Pastor Jennings. Sometimes, yo, you're gonna have to get you one of them preachers that can holler, that can inspire you. That's what I love about Pastor Jennings. <laughs> Am I all right? You know, T.D. Jakes. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. You need that. Apostle Tom said, money cometh. You got to get violent with that thing. And that's the God knows truth. If you want it, sometimes you got to get violent to take it. And I'm here to tell you, man, when you take it, don't you let it go. Don't you let nobody talk you out of it. And don't you talk yourself out of it. Because we have a tendency to self-sabotage ourselves at times. We get to a certain level and then the enemy comes or people come. And then we talk ourselves out of it. We walk ourselves back down the steps and walk ourselves out the, out the blessing. Hell no. Yeah, I said it. Hell no. So I'm here to tell you this day is that the word of the Lord is going to come. It's going to try you. It's going to try you in the midst of obscurity to see if you have integrity. But it's also going to try you in the place of prominence to see whether or not you are going to use your strength and your power against those who can't defend themselves. Or even those who can't even do nothing for you. And so that's where the test of character comes. The test of integrity and the test of character. These are the tests that the word of the Lord comes and it tries us in those areas. So I'm going to finish on out. And they all answered according as our Lord speaketh. So will we do. And they bowed to him to the ground. So they bowed to him three times when they first saw him. And then the second time they bowed to him. And then this third time they bowed to him. And when you look at the significance. Joseph's dream was that they bowed to him three times. And that's what ended up happening. They ended up bowing before him. And that was the dream that came to pass. The, the dreams about the stalks. The dreams about the stars. They bowed down before him. And so now the test is on to see whether or not there are going to be men of their word. That they're going to bring back their brother. So he kept Simeon as insurance. And so that's what the word of the Lord does. To try you. It tried them but it also tried Joseph as well. And so I want to end this message today. Just saying man yo. God is, is, is going to try you. What I'm here to tell you is that you have faith. Is that you have the word of the Lord that has brought you thus. And when I gave you the illustration about Bruce Leroy. It was his training prior that brought him to that final battle with Shonuf. But then he remembered and those things came back up on the inside of him that he found that he could overcome. He could overcome that, that last test with what he already had. What I'm trying to tell you today, that what you already got on the inside of you is more than enough to bring you over. You just have to walk in integrity and walk in godly character to take you over. And that is the takeaway for today. Walk in integrity. Walk in character. Because you are in the place of God and the word of the Lord is trying you in the place of God. Because you are called to be a deliverer. And that's the one thing that I want you to see. We can sit up here all day and say it ain't fair. Life is not fair. But the one thing that I love about God is that all things, even the unfairness, work together for my good. So hey, I want you guys to be blessed if you have not subscribed to the Truth and Life Urban Ministry Podcast, I want you to subscribe to the podcast. I also want you to sign and subscribe to the Brother Leon Show. Man, we are going to be having some bad... I'm telling you, we're going to have some good interviews because God knows, man, we got 
Sister uh, Shayna Singleton is going to be with us. And the one thing, man, yo, that interview is going to be on point because she calls herself the herpes goddess. And she is an activist in overcoming the stigma when it comes to the herpes virus as well as other STDs. And so there are a lot of women who are doing that work today because these are our deliverers. These are our, our women who are bringing healing to our community because there are so many people who struggle with the stigma of herpes and, and sexually transmitted diseases. They settle for negative relationships. They feel as though that, you know, nobody ain't going to want them and things of that nature. But I'm here to tell you that there are people who can help you overcome it. And so, you know, Belief Spivey, man, she is a blessing. Shayna Singleton, she is definitely a blessing. So, hey, I'm going to tell you, man, look, follow them on social media. You know, if you are dealing dealing with it, dealing with herpes, dealing with any type of sexually transmitted disease, and you are dealing with, with self issues of self-confidence, follow these ladies because they are experts in their field. I had the opportunity to, to interview Belize Spivey on more than more than one occasion. And I'm going to tell you, every time we have had an interview, she has brought it. I'm telling you, she has brought revelation. She has brought freedom to our listeners. And so, man, I can't wait to have, you know, Sister uh, Shayna Singleton on because this interview is definitely going to be um, it's going to be on point. It's going to be thunderous. <laughs> That's the God knows you. So I can't wait. And I'm like, man, we are in December you know, I'm just going to be hearing from God, Lord, what do you want to do, you know, for the next year? We're going to be talking about the glory of God. And I do know that. So we're going to finish this up in the place of God. And then we're going to go into the glory of God. So I want you guys to be blessed. And I ain't going to lie, man. It has definitely been a pleasure. Man, I have been on here almost an hour and a half. <laughs> oh, Lord, I thank you. Praise God. truth and life you have freedom follow truth and life urban ministry on itunes spotify and iHeartRadio. like share and subscribe to truth and life urban ministry